2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to read verses 23 through 28. That's Sister Shirley, probably a prayer request. I should have turned that off. Amen. Pray for Sister Shirley. She did say, first three words, I need prayer. Pray for Sister Shirley. Verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in laborers, more in more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths oft of the jews five times received i forty stripes save one thrice was i beaten with rods once was i stoned thrice i suffered shipwreck a night and a day i have been in the deep in journeys often in perils of waters in perils of robbers in perils of mine own countrymen in perils by the the heathen in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, and watching often, in hunger and thirst, and fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. God is our strength. That's what we want to. That's the. The emphasis of what Paul is writing about in this letter, and he he shares uh, what he's gone through and how God strengthened him in this part of the letter. And so, we want to think about these these qualities that developed him as a leader, and it did not come without opposition. It was matter of fact, you could say that those oppositions is what made Paul the great leader that he had become. Um, in 1967, a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Holmes uh, created a test, and this test is called the holmes Ray Stress Inventory. And they would take and provide a scale. It was a what they called a simple measure how to uh, how different things, different aspects of stress would affect people. And... They would predict the way in which that stress could cause illness uh, in our lives. And if you've ever been stressed, you know that the, um, the limits that it could push you to and, and things that you could face. In creating this test, Dr. Holmes considered various changes and situations. And, and the way he did this is he took a numeric value, a numeric value and assigned points for the amount of stress it caused. And so, some, for instance, he would give the death of a spouse would be 100 points. Being fired from your job, 47 points. Having a baby, 39 points. Vacations, 13 points. Christmas, 12 points. According to Dr. Holmes, when a person reached 200 points, that person was in deep trouble. Now, we could just begin to wonder if this test was there and in place when the Apostle Paul was facing those just the things that he listed in what we read as a text, I would imagine he far exceeded 200 points very quickly, wouldn't you? The the amount of points he would have accumulated. And what was he saying here? He was saying that ministry is stressful, that not just ministry is stressful, but life as a Christian is stressful. Life in general is stressful. And in this section of his letter, he describes how uh, in this in our text that we use, he said he was beaten five times. He was shipwrecked three times. He was in constant perils of journeys, robbed, persecuted frequently, weary and hungry often. He also described the stress that came from being concerned in that final verse, verse 28, just the stress of being concerned about the state of the churches that he'd helped to find, the churches that he planted, the, the stress that was there uh, in, in taking care of those churches and, and the stress of concern for other people. And any any pastor, it, it said this way, any pastor worth his weight in salt um, would be concerned about their congregation. Many times for us as pastors, we could life could be good for us, things could be great for us, but we have a great concern. Uh, there's a song that we've sung before on, uh, I believe it was Pastor Appreciation a couple of years ago, praise team sung it entitled Spirit Wind. And it talks about how a pastor looks at his congregation that used to be on fire for the Lord, and now it's just 
uh, carnal people living carnal lives, just empty stares. And there's a concern, there's a stress level that comes with that. And, and Paul had that, and many ministers have had that. And, and so it's not just about being beaten. It's not been about being shipwrecked. It's not about being robbed and weary and hungry that brings stress. It's the concern for others, for leaders, for those that they lead that also brings about this. So Paul was able to weather all these hardships. How was he able to do that? He didn't look to his own power. He didn't look to, it, to, to survive those things. He did not look to himself, but he looked to the, for the power of the Spirit of God to, uh, that was living within him, the, the Holy Ghost power that he received there on that Damascus road at his conversion. Uh, and when Ananias prayed for him, he received that power of the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost. And he had grown inwardly, and as he was assailed outwardly, he was growing inwardly. So when we're facing stuff on the outside, we shouldn't be too concerned about that as long as we are growing and strengthening that inner man. This outer man, it's going to perish. It's going to have hardships, and it's going to have struggles. This flesh is going to fail us. As we get older, it starts to break down. It starts to decay. It starts to have its problems, and, and you start uh, uh, feeling pains in places, uh, muscle pains where you didn't even know you had muscles. You just... You just begin, it's just the way this body is. It begins to, we have those outward deals. And, but then we also have those persecutions that comes from without. Uh, but we got to make sure uh, uh, that we stay strong within. So in that same way, we can measure uh, the matter of troubles that we face. We can trust God to be with us in the midst of our trouble. All that live godly are going to suffer problems scripture says all that live godly is going to suffer persecutions you're going to have hardships uh, if if you're saved and you've got loved ones that you want to be saved you're going to be concerned about them that's going to cause uh, some stress levels there's going to be some times of wondering uh, there's going to be some times of uh, fretting uh, uh, there uh, some can be considered uh, some may consider me a worry a worry wart parent uh, since my son started driving, my son turns 20 Saturday, but I still tell him, whenever you get where you're going, text me and let me know that you got there. And he, he's almost 20 years old. Uh, he goes to work in the morning. He's going to a different job site each day. When you get there, just let me know you got there. And that's just, that's just me. That's just what I, I need to know. And, and if I don't hear from him, Amy can see where he's at on her phone. And I'll ask him. I'll, I'll ask her. Check, see where Noah's at because he hasn't texted me. And, and so that, that's, just, that's just part of being a parent and, and part of uh, what we do. So just like Paul, we need to take steps now before the trials come to strengthen our relationship with God so we can understand what it means to rely on His strength. Because there's all kinds of things in this world that's going to bring us, uh, try to deplete us of our strength. And, and so we're just going to go through uh, this chapter uh, like we typically do and just look at it. The first four verses, uh, as we read, is concern for the believer's faithfulness is what Paul is dis discussing here. Um, my, the header in my Bible says it's Paul's fear of false teachers. There is false teachers. There, that is concerning. And, and some people will fall for anything. Hook, line, and sinker. And they'll, they'll just because it glitters, just because it shines. Can, can I tell you, as Pentecostals, just because it speaks in tongues, some kind of tongue don't mean it's of God. Just because it may look like it you you've got to have discernment and without the holy ghost being filled with the holy ghost you lack that discernment and so here's paul's concern he's got concerns for believers faithfulness and 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 people probably get aggravated with us pastors all the time why do they always want us to be at church why are they always always uh, uh nagging on us about this nagging on that but my, my question is, what kind of pastor would you have if he had no concern about your faithfulness to the house of God, the things of God? Oh, it's all right. Just do whatever you want to do. Get here when you can. No, God's given us a word for you. That's why we want you here. God has given us uh, 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 things to disciple you and to instill within you that you can grow, that you can be strong. Why? Because we know you're going to face some stuff. 
you're going to face some opposition and you're going to need this spiritual strength uh, and and to know that if you get here uh, i guarantee you uh, i would not be begging and pleading with people to get here if i wasn't ready for them to be here because i come ready to deliver the word that god has placed upon my heart for you for your family uh, and to see what god would do and so that's what paul was dealing with every minister has this concern for believers faithfulness he said would to god he could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, uh, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so, to, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he hath cometh pre, if, for he that cometh preaching another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive another spirit in which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might bear, bear, bear well with them. Paul has pointed out the folly of his opponents. They were full of self-praise, and he realized that there was a bit of self-praise on his part, and that he wanted to defend himself against the charges that was there. But he also said um, that he, he said there that... Um, I am jealous over you. I have espoused you to one husband. And he is saying, I, it's my responsibility. He's looking at him as he is the father and they're the children. Uh, and we are the bride of Christ. And he said, I am preparing you as the bride of Christ uh, to be the bride of Christ, uh, to, for the bridegroom. Uh, and, 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 and you're going to stand before him one day, and I'm going to present you uh, before him as the bride of Christ. And, and I cannot let you. Uh, and allow you to be uh, deceived and brought under the attention of those uh, that are promoting another way, another gospel, another Jesus. Uh, there, there's there's plenty out there. They'll they'll use uh, they'll they'll use the same Bible. They'll use the same verses, and they'll you've got to have an understanding. You've got to have an understanding of the Word of God. Uh, people say, I don't need church. I don't need a pastor. I, I don't need. We all we need a shepherd can i can i tell you even i as a pastor i need a pastor i have several pastors i mentors men of god that i look to that uh, that hold me accountable that i ha- have them that i draw from and glean from uh, because we need that guidance and and paul is saying that we've got to be careful because if they if we find them preaching another jesus uh, we find them preaching something that you have not heard here there needs to be red flags that go up and he continues on, not just that concern for that, but he goes on verses 5 through 11 with a burden, the burden that he has. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, for though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and and wanted, and I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied in all things, I, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Archaea. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth he's asking them some questions there he, he's engaging in this uh this conversation to let the, the people know he's letting them paul know that he's received criticism from them and and some had had, had criticized his efforts but uh, verse 8 was interesting to me it says i robbed other churches and and i, I think that in that translation there, they used a strong word uh, uh, there. But what Paul was saying is, uh, I, I took from other churches to be sure that your financial needs were taken care of. Uh, and so I was not about to take from you. You were in a time of need. So I took from other churches, taking wages to do you service.
Jesus, uh, and the need was met. He said that those that there was nothing lacking because another church came in and took care of that uh, and supplied that need. Uh, that there was deficit there. There was a burden uh, that you was already facing. And he said, "I was not going to put a financial burden on your already financial burden." Uh, and he said, "God supplies the needs. God took care of it, uh, and we were not lacking, uh, and no one was lacking." Uh, and then he asked them some questions there in verse 10, uh, in verse 11. Uh, he, he, he presents it in verse 10 as the truth of Christ is in me. No man shall stop me from the boasting in the regions of Achaia. He, and then he asked a question, wherefore? He said, because I love you not. And he's asking a question there. That's not a statement. He's asked, do you think that I don't love you? God knows that I love you. God knows. He said, I, I may sound rude in speech because... I love you. I may seem stern in my writing is because I love you. Uh, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't take my time to write you a letter to, to say, listen, you need to be cautious. You need to be aware. Uh, and so he must have really loved them because he gave them two letters. I just want to make sure that you understand what is required of God's Word for us as believers uh, because there are those, uh, Paul is definitely dealing with it, there is those out there who uh, they, they can present all kinds of stuff to you, but they don't love you like I love you. They, they are, they're not vested in you like I'm vested in you. He already told them, you are my resume. You are the, Many of these were converts of Paul. They got saved uh, and came to the Lord under his ministry. Uh, can I tell you, there, there is not another uh, preacher, there's not another person uh, uh, down the road, whatever it is, uh, that's going to care for you like the one that you got saved under. They're vested in you. So, so many people that uh, Paul is, is saying here, listen, they're, they're, going to, they're, they're in this recruitment stage and they're trying to grow something and they're trying to blossom something uh, and, and people chase after that and uh, it, it's glittering and it's shining and it, it seems like it's good, it seems like it's great and people run after it. Uh, but he, he is saying, uh, listen, uh, but what, understand uh, that I love you, that I preach the way, that I correct you the way that I do because I love you but they didn't want to be corrected and he goes on to do some reluctant boasting in verses 12 through 21 Paul says but what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory they may be found even as we for, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool, and otherwise, yet as a fool receiveth me, that I may boast myself a little." That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in the confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For you suffer, if a man bring you into the bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak in concerning reproach as though we had been weak. How be it, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Paul is describing those that were ridiculing him, questioning his authority, preaching another message of the gospel. And he said, basically, you're falling for their foolishness. You are wiser. You ever told somebody, you're, typically this would be something we tell our kid, you're smarter than that. Right? And that's what Paul is saying here. You're smarter than this. You, you should have known better. How many times have you said that as a parent? You should have known better. Better yet, how many times have you said that to yourself in the mirror? You should have known better. 
And he's saying they're, they're foolishly bringing, and they're out there. And he said, uh, let me tell you, they, they've got to act like they have a lot to glory in, and, and, and they, they're presenting all of these things, and they're pr- giving you this great presentation, and, and they're bragging on themselves and, and glorying in themselves. He said, basically what he's saying here, I could do that too. And he, he did a little bit there. He went into a little bit of boasting there. Uh, he said, I may boast myself a little that I've accomplished some things. There's some things that I can boast about. And so he said, that which I speak, I speak not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in the confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh. He's saying their glory is after the flesh. He said, I could do that. I could glory after the flesh. But what is something Paul wrote in another place? He said, I choose to speak nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ. I, I choose. He said, I come not with enticing men, words of men's wisdom. What, what Paul is saying, he said, I could baffle you with brilliance. I could do that. I, he could boastfully say that, and we know Paul of Saul was very boastful. Uh, there, there's no way that he was on his way to the Sanhedrin without boasting in his religious knowledge, and, and he could just, uh, you know, he could just say things that would blow their minds. Uh, but he said, "I choose to to preach." the gospel i glory not in my boasting in my accomplishments and what i have Uh, if paul lived in this day and time uh, he would probably have two or three doctorates uh, in theology and all of those things that's laid out uh, and he could he would be considered one of the smartest one of the most brilliant uh, and more importantly one of the most anointed men of god uh, to walk in shoe leather Uh, but he said i don't boast in that my boasting is uh, and he shared what his boasting was time and time again my testimony uh, I uh, and he shared it with kings he shared it with peasants he shared it with soldiers and guards uh, I was uh, against God's people uh, and then the light of the Lord shone about me uh, remember what Felix told him much learning has made you mad uh, so Paul was known as being well learned a, a very brilliant mind and Felix said much learning has made you mad uh, he said no sir uh, much learning has not made me mad the king knows what i'm talking about Uh, king agrippa knows what i am talking about because what my god did uh, he didn't do in a corner what god did in my life uh, he did it on the damascus road and let me tell you about it Uh, this is what god did for me Uh, and by the time he got done with that king he said almost thou persuadest me uh, to be a christian Uh, and paul didn't just say well well i tried Uh, and he didn't he went on he pushed that point a little more he said i I wish to not just almost but all together not you but everyone that hears uh, my voice would be as I am except for these bonds uh, he said I've got a lot to boast about I've preached before kings I've, I've been in the, uh, the, uh, the audience of kings to present this gospel he said but that's not what it's about uh, it's not what it's about it's about suffering for Christ remember when Ananias says you sure Lord Saul you know who he is He goes, yeah, I've chosen him. And what did he say? He said, he's going to suffer for me. He's going to suffer for me. And he did. And Paul shared that in in our text. And and I won't read those verses again. We read those for a text, but I will pick up at verse 29 where we left off. He said, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must need glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Artius, the king kept the city of the Damascians uh, with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Paul now says, begins to compare himself to these false teachers who infiltrated Corinth at this time. And Paul begins to say, uh, there's a lot of things that I glory. He said, I, if I must needs glory, if there's going to be any glory, he said, I'm not going to glory in my accomplishments. I'm not going to glory in all the things that I've done. He said, but this is those things that he listed in our text. He said, that's what I glory in, my infirmities. My infirmities. He said, I count it. A joy. I count it an honor that I was able to suffer for Christ. That I was able to to stand 
in, in the midst of persecution and, and, and as he recounted all of these hardships. Listen, what we read as a text in, in those verses, uh, uh, verses 23 through 28, 22 through 28, uh, uh, Paul lists these things out. Uh, uh, he begins to, to lay out uh, all of these hardships. This is one not Paul having a pity party. This is not Paul saying, this is everything I had to go through, and I don't know why I had to go through it, but I went through it. No, Paul said, I glory in the fact that I've been shipwrecked, that I've been beaten, that I've been left for dead. I, I believe Brother Paul preached this uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and I heard somebody else preaching it the other day. Uh, that They drug him out of town and laid him there. He was dead. They thought he was dead uh, and, and just left him there. And, uh, and he said, I'm not dead. Uh, he got up, went back into town, preached the same message message that he pretty much just picked up where he left off, went back to preaching. Uh, he said, I glory in that. They beat me to death. They beat me to death. Dead. They didn't just think he was dead. I believe he was dead. They beat him to death. He stands up, spits out the blood, walks back into town, goes back to preaching. It's, it's kind of like in those movies where a guy rears back and punches a dude in the mouth. Noah was telling me the other day, he, seems, he said, it seems like all of those action movies have that scene where a guy's tied to a chair and somebody just rears back and pops him in the mouth and then they just spit the blood out and laugh at him. He said, I think he was talking about Indiana Jones. He said, I think every Indiana Jones movie, he does that. Just spits the blood out. I said, I guarantee you, if you strap to a chair and somebody comes back cold cocks, you're not spitting no blood out. You're going to split about 12 teeth out, and you're going out. You're done. Some of those dudes were big. But that, that's the scene that's there. Paul was beaten to death, and he rises up. And you know what? He said, I didn't rise up in my own power. I, I, he, I physically was left for dead. There was nothing I could do to overcome this. So I glory in those infirmities uh, because it was in my weakness. Uh, he was made strong in me and through me. Uh, and so Paul writes about that over and over and over again. So as we look back, that's the historical context of it, and we begin to look at the story. He asked the believers to permit him, he said, a little folly as he engaged in some self-praise or uh, to, to defend himself a little bit. And he spoke about, his fear of their faithfulness and bluntly stated that he was not inferior to any other apostle. He said, I am not inferior to anybody. And so, so we need to make that clear that Paul is not boasting here. Paul is not arrogant. When you're full of the power of God and God has called you and God has anointed you, you're not inferior to anybody. I, I have come across some Church of God officials over the years that thought they could talk down to me, and I've just talked right back to them. I said, listen, you're a bishop, I'm a bishop. I told one state overseer one time, I said, you put your pants on one leg at a time just like I do. We're men. I have the same credentials you have. And so I am not inferior to you. Don't, you're not going to speak down to me as I am inferior to you because I may be younger than you or you may have served in your position. The same God that called you called me. I've told him I don't need your credentials. I've got my calling because that's, that's what Paul, and sometimes people push you to that point. They had pushed Paul to that point. He said, listen, there, there's reasons. Uh, I, he's, he said he explained why he humbled himself in the midst, and he didn't accept their financial support. Uh, he explained that there was no need to put a unneeded burden when he was already taken care of, so there was no reason uh, for him to have to do that. Uh, he then confronted the Corinthians about their preference for false apostles and encouraged them to recognize the sincerity and truth of his message. Uh, there needs to be a challenge again that will begin to challenge people uh, and encourage people to turn away from false prophecy. Uh, it, we, we need to get, we're in a day and time, uh, and if I could just challenge us as a church, uh, turn off that so-called Christian television. It's junk. I can get a better amen than that. It's false junk. It's charismatic. It's it's moving of the flesh. It's a mixture of the world. And that's what Paul, that's a, the, the response that I'm getting tonight. It's the same response that Paul got because they for, preferred a false prophets. People would prefer to send their money to somebody they saw on TV. They don't know where their money's going to, and they won't even bring their tithe into the storehouse. 
He encouraged them to recognize the sincerity and the truth of the message and, and realize the need there. And he, he ended this section uh, as he began it, laying out his impressive credentials uh, as a Jew and as an apostle, even though he felt foolish about doing so. Paul mo- was motivated to present these credentials, not to brag, not to brag, but to let them know who was leading them and where his credentials came from. They came from God. They were God-given. He said, I accomplished a lot in the religious realm. He, he asked those questions. He asked there, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. I've been there, done that. Uh, I, I've been in that. Re- I've run in that religious circle. Uh, basically, what he's saying: I've been that false teacher. I've been that one that preached against Christ. I've been that one that persecuted Christ. He said, I had to be, when I left that, I had to be let down in the basket uh, to get away from those that wanted to kill me because I got away from that. He said, I am no longer teaching false. He said, I did everything I could to persecute, and now I've submitted my life. I'll be beaten. I'll be shipwrecked. I'll be left for dead uh, to encourage, uh, to inspire, uh, to uplift, uh, to instill uh, this gospel. Why? Because I heard these words. Uh, Paul, uh, Saul, uh, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? Uh, I am Jesus. Uh, remember, he was killing Jesus' followers, uh, and Jesus, sp- he said, I heard from the man himself. Uh, the man himself called me out, uh, and he changed me. Uh, he said, I am done with uh, false apostleships. Uh, I am done with false teachings. Uh, I'm done with getting called up and all of that. Uh, I am going to motivate you uh, to serve the Lord. He summarized the strength and the weakness of his ministry and how those skill sets came about. Paul understood the need there. And he was really unconcerned about looking foolish in the eyes of the Corinths. He felt the need to present everything and to let them know that what he boasts, he said, if I'm going to boast, if I'm going to glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. He had a lot to boast about, but he said, if I've got to boast in something, he said, here's all the things I could boast about, but I'd prefer to boast about my infirmities because those are things I went through because I took a stand. How much have we gone through because we took a stand? We don't know what persecution is. Somebody tells us that they don't want to go to our church and we feel persecuted. Somebody tells us, um, I don't believe in your God and we feel persecuted persecuted somebody tells us i don't believe that way and we feel persecuted somebody cusses in our presence we feel persecuted we don't know persecution paul said i I boast in these things because i went through these things because i took a stand has anybody ever threw a rock at you because you serve the lord has anybody ever beaten you to a bloody pulp and left you for dead we haven't faced it. We have brothers and sisters around this world who have faced that in, in countries that they, they better not go out in the public forum and confess Christ. We know that in the underground churches of China, how precious the Word of God is to them because they have to do it secretly because if they did it openly, it would cost them their lives. They're beaten. They're put in those camps. And they're all of those. One of the, one of the most amazing stories that I've I've ever heard is they would take parts of the Bible and they would pass it around and they would quickly write it because it would be passed to someone else. But they had a portion. They had a portion of God's Word in their possession. They may have just had the letters of, to the Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. That's all they had. But they, they learned it. They knew it. They memorized We've got the whole book. We probably, any, anybody that's been a Christian any amount of time probably got three or four of them laying around. We got it on our cell phones. We got it on our iPads. We've got it everywhere. But the Word of God is precious to them. And so they face that. So we need to, to see how, how can we apply this message to us. What situations or circumstances cause us stress in life? Paul, 
Paul was not stressed because he was beaten. He was not stressed because he was shipwrecked. He was not stressed because of, he said he glories in those infirmities. His stress was a bunch of false teachers. A bunch of false teachers was trying to pull away his sheep. Was trying to pull away those that he invested his life to serve. That someone was trying to foolishly instill within them another gospel. Preach to them another Jesus, he said. Preach to them another gospel. He said, that's got me upset. If I sound rude, if I sound harsh, if I sound aggravated, that's aggravating to me. There's something I've got to do about it. I, and so he said, I wrestle not against flesh and blood. He said, I can't go and knock them out. I can't go and drop kick them. But I can warn you. Remember what we've said from the beginning? Get your attention back here. All of that's trying to get your attention away from me. Get, I can write to you. I can challenge you and try my best to get your attention back, hoping that you will realize, realize that the errors of your ways, that you've listened to someone who was wrong. And so when he spoke of the inward person in there in um, 2 Corinthians 4 and 16, he was speaking of the soul or spirit. That's the center of our personality where the Spirit of the Lord is. When we're filled with the Holy Ghost, that's where, where it is, right there. The key to standing strong in the midst of stress is to strengthen that inward person. In a, in a ship or a submarine, it's called the bridge. It, it's the heart. When we, talk about the, when we talk about the heart, when we talk about it, it, it is not this organ in our chest that pumps blood. But it's, it's the inward man. It's, it's in this way, the inward strength. It's the way that we can face whatever life brings our way because the strength with which God gives us and fills us with helps us to meet that test. When we're filled with the Spirit, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come, come upon you. Problem is, we live in an outward world. Problem is, it's the outward side influence that gets our attention the most. And we've, we've talked a lot about that. It causes us to depend on our senses, such as feel and taste and smell and all of those. That, that's, that's the world we live in. Uh, we, the inward tends to get lost in the shuffle. And, and, and so just for a few moments, and I want us to look at a few reasons for this. The first reason is this. We do not have a proper appreciation for eternity. See, we, we're focused on the outward. That's not eternity. We're, we're focused on our, I don't know what the average lifespan is anymore. I think it's 74 years, I believe, is the average. But we're, we're fo say we live to be 100 years old. We're focused on that 100-year span of outward, of what takes place. Our life is much more than that. Our life is much more. The Bible says that the inward part of our lives, it goes on through eternity. The soul we have now is the same soul we will have throughout eternity. This body's going to fail. This body's only going to last so long. So long. It's going to, should time tarry, pastor's going to preach your funeral. Or somebody will. Somebody may preach my funeral. I may attend your funeral. You may attend mine. Who knows? The Bible says, though, that that soul that we have is going to live throughout eternity. Death is not something we as Christians worry about because that already happened. We already died out. We already died out to the flesh, already died out to the world. I'm gonna, I love the, what the songwriter said, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to die no never. Why? Because Jesus died on a tree for me, so I'm going to live forever. And we, we got to grasp that concept of eternity so we build our inward person. We're building that part of us that is eternal. Uh, we've got to quit focusing on the external. We give so much attention uh, to the outward, uh, and, and we neglect the inward. Uh, we neglect the spiritual man uh, because of the needs of the outward man. For some reason, the things of the flesh are so much more important to us then that part of us is going, that is going to live for a short time, and that is going to live forever. So we've got to do something about that. 
Second reason is this. We don't have God's perspective on life. The world tells us the most important thing we possess is this body. Take care of this body. We need to take care of our body for sure. But the emphasis, keep it beautiful, keep it strong, keep it young, because it's everything. If we're not careful, we'll allow the world to squeeze us into that mold. Uh, but in contrast, God emphasizes the inward person, uh, that he's looking on the heart. Uh, and and people, will, people will use that, and they'll twist God's word uh, and, and say, you know, uh, when, when, uh, when uh, Samuel went down to uh, Jesse's house, and he's going to pick a king, and he looks at David. People have loved to take that scripture uh, where Sam, Samuel thought for sure that the older brother, uh, because of his stature and all of that, that he had to be the next king. Uh, and God said, he is not it. He said that God looks on the heart, and man looks on the outward appearance. Uh, people love to use that verse to say, God don't care what I look like on the outside. That don't matter to God. No, if you got Jesus on the inside, he shows up on the outside. If you're sanctified on the inside, it shows up on the outside. And what he is saying there uh, is that God uh, is putting that emphasis on that inward man uh, that should reflect on the outward man because we are the light of the world, uh, that we should not be bringing attention to ourselves. with our, And Peter talks about this, and Timothy talks about this in their writings, uh, that we should not be doing and dressing and acting in ways that brings attention to the outward. Uh, there need to attention that needs to be brought to us is that inward man, uh, that they need to see uh, the power and the presence and the anointing of God upon our lives. Uh, and so we've got to get that perspective, not our perspective on life, but God's perspective on life, uh, and to know uh, that God looks at our heart, and God is working in our heart, and God is dealing with our heart, uh, but we also got to be conscious that we live in an outward world. Uh, what does that mean? It means that your co-workers, your family, those you come in contact with they can't see your heart they can't see what's inside of you so what's inside of you must reflect what's on the outside of us uh, we've, we've never they say women are different than men that uh, that women are not so caught up on looks as men but I guarantee you that I never dated a girl or asked a girl out because I thought she might have had a good personality no I, she looked good she's cute I'm going to think I'm going to get her number. It wasn't, well, you know, she's ugly as a mud fence, but I'm sure she's sweet. We don't look inside. We look on the outside. And so that's the appearances that we want to, to have, God's emphasis on that perspective of life. The third reason is we don't value, we don't value the inward person. Paul shared it there, their accomplishments, his accomplishments. We live in an accomplishment-oriented society. You know what? Spending time with God, along with God, will build that inward person. It don't show up on a task list or accomplishment chart. Nobody sees the time that you spent in prayer this week. But all it takes, remember what they said about the disciples? They said, they perceived they were ignorant and unlearned men. They said, I don't know about these guys. But it also said they had perceived that they had been with Jesus. It just took just a little time of hearing them speak to know that what we see, what we see there, what we perceive to be not very smart or not very learned, there's a power there. There's a presence there. That doesn't show up on a, on a certificate on a wall. So instead of spending our time doing outward things, putting on a good show and creating a good shell, keeping up with the Joneses and trying to look good, wanting everybody to think that we are something that we're not, boasting in this and boasting in that, how about we just pray, fast, Seek the face of God. Get in His Word. Not read the Bible just so we can say, I read four chapters today. What did it say? I don't know. I've read it, though. Not just to 
mumble and blumble and fumble just so you can say you prayed, but to have an intimate communication with your Heavenly Father. How many knows that there's a difference in just filling a time spot and really having a season of prayer? Man, when you come out of a season of prayer, you know it because you're strengthening that inward man. Inside, we may be feeling empty because nobody cares to ask us how we're doing inwardly, but we've got all of these accomplishments, all of these accomplishments. I had a, a boss several years ago. Man, he was well accomplished. He owned his own business. He lived on the St. John's River, and he had everything that money could buy. He paid me my paycheck every week, cash money every Thursday. So I wouldn't have to worry about going to the bank, cashing a check. He did that for all of his employees. All the taxes were done, everything. He'd give us an envelope for our cash. He was good to us. I worked at his house every Saturday, cleaning, raking, whatever. And he would pay me extra for that. Had a beautiful home. His mother's home was next to him. His son's home was there. All of them on this nice little compound there. Outwardly, he seemed like he had it all together. But one morning, he stepped out on his dock there on the St. John's River, pulled a pistol out, and blew his brains out. Because inwardly, he didn't have anything together. Inward, he, my dad worked with, for him for years. They took care of my baby sister's funeral when she passed away. Good people, good people. But they said, we don't believe in God. His son told me one time there was a Jehovah Witness gathering taking place. We were there at um, just two blocks from the stadium there where Jaguars play now and, and Veterans Memorial Stadium, and they were having a Jehovah Witness gathering, and they were people asking. They always asked us for directions to get there. And He looked down there, and he saw all those cars, and jokingly he said, I don't know who Jehovah is, but he sure got a lot of witnesses. They just good people, good-hearted people. Outwardly, it would seem like, man, they got it all together, but good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Our responsibility is to push past the obstacles and to strengthen our trust in God in every area of life. We do this not by just being good. That, that People love to go that time. God's not going to send me to hell. I'm a good person. I had a coworker many years ago, and, and he, he told me. I was 16 years old, and I think he was probably 18, 19 years old. And he said, I just can't believe that. He said, I'm a good person. I just can't believe that if I die, I'm going to go to hell. I'm, I'm a good person, and I don't, I don't see how. And I told him that same thing. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people do. And so it's not about good works that we should boast, but studying God's Word, spending time in prayer, and simply this. You really want to have prayer time? Go to prayer and don't say a word. Remaining silent in his presence. Why? So he can speak. So he can speak. Several few years ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and just felt that need to go to prayer and, and got up and went into my prayer closet and closed the door and got myself ready and got down and, and I was just fixing to just tear off into prayer. And God said, uh-uh, I got you up because I want to talk. I want to talk. And God began to speak. It's in those moments that we find that strength of the inward man. Not when we're complaining about everything that's going on on the outward, but we really begin to evaluate and assess our prayer lives, how much time is spent about everything that's going wrong on the outward instead of a desire to strengthen the inward. We need to make a shift in our prayer lives that it's about strengthening the inward, not trying to make the outward better. We fight against enemies of the soul, the attitudes, the obstacles, the distractions that keep us from focusing on inward. Uh, we have to realize, don't be ignorant of that. Uh, all of those things that's coming against your outward, coming against your flesh, coming against your mind, coming against uh, your family, it's not about those things. It's not about those things. It's about to get you in a place that you don't have an intimate relationship with Christ. 
And Paul saw this. He saw that these false prophets that were coming against with all this stuff, he said, I understand very well what's going on here, that the more we invest in our relationship with God right now is the more we'll be able to rest and trust in Him when we do face struggles. We don't have to worry about when struggles come because we've already prepared ourselves for it. We've already established. And that's, that's what Paul was talking about here in this portion of the letter. He said there's false teachers. There's a lot of boasting going on. But there's a lot of things that's going to bring stress. There's a lot of things that's going to oppose us. As we get ready to come to the altar tonight to spend a season in prayer, I want you to ask yourself this question. What steps am I going to take to ensure that I'm looking to God and His strength to give me what I need on the inward man to face everything that's going to come against me outwardly in the future? Realizing this, that it's coming against me as a child of God. It's not... A, after me Satan already had us he's not after your flesh he's not after your talent he's not after your ability Satan could care less Satan could care less if you sing on a church platform or in a bar room he don't care just as long as that inward man is not in the right relationship with God he don't care where you showcase your talents. Don't matter to him. If you're going to boast in the world or boast in the church, he don't care. He just wants you to brag on yourself. Bring attention to self. Don't matter to the devil as long as we're bringing attention to the flesh and not to God. But Paul said, I'm going to bring glory to God. I'll glory in the infirmities. I'll glory in the stripes that I took on this back for the gospel's sake. I, 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 take, I take no glory for the fights that I won in this world, defending my name or defending my possessions or my people or the group that I was running with or the gang that I was with. That's not important. But I do glory in the fact that I've been through some stuff because I choose to say I've got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. Because I choose to say, devil, I'm not backing down from you. See, so many people feel the hot breath of the devil down their neck and they get scared to death. Why? Because they've done nothing to strengthen the inward man, and they're trying to face him on their own strength, their own knowledge of, of mind concept, of something that, oh, let me see if I can remember something that I learned while that preacher was preaching or that teacher was teach, trying to make it academic. This isn't academic. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. It's the school of Christ. It's the school of learning the Word. Students of the Word. Not to get it up here, but to get it deep in here. To get it deep in here. David said it this way, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. When do we sin against him? When opposition and temptation comes. Calls it, when, when we face the hardest trial that we've ever faced and we come out on the other side with our hands still uplifted and our eyes still lifted to heaven I love that song it says not because I'm good not because I'm great not because I'm strong I just held on I just held on what are we holding on to? A faith that's deep within an anchor of a soul which is both sure and steadfast. I'm anchored in Jesus, not my accomplishments. I'm anchored in the Lord, not my credentials. I'm anchored in the Lord, not my titles. Years ago at General Assembly, one of our 
administrative bishop said this, it's time that we lay down the title and pick up the towel. Quit worried about your title and begin to serve God's people again. Our current general overseer said that the preacher needs to get the microphone back. What was he talking about? He says it's time that we start preaching again. All this trying to inspire people with all the outward accomplishments and deeds and tasks and feel good about yourselves and warm fuzzy feelings and no preach the word wasn't that Paul's words to Timothy preach the word you can't go wrong with the word let's strengthen our inner man tonight around these altars will you come and join me around these altars because we're going to face some stuff the enemy is going to oppose you on every hand, but you'll be ready if you've spent time with your master. Father, we gather in these altars tonight, realizing just as Paul faced some infirmities, faced some hardships, faced some trials that we cannot even imagine, that we too will face some stuff, but we too will come out strong as long as we keep our trust and our confidence in you. And don't fall for another gospel. Don't fall for another message to stay true to your word stay true to your will strengthen us tonight in Jesus name we pray